Hi and thanks for tuning in. In this video we're going to take a look at the career of the great Lord Frost and ask the question, how could somebody with his experience get things so wrong? Now, as he himself is now openly blaming his predecessors, as he did in the Northern Ireland Assembly just a couple of weeks ago, perhaps it could be said that he wasn't the man for the job. But I'm going to leave that for you to decide. Now, let's not think this guy is some jumped up civil servant who rose through the ranks because he was holding on to the coattails of some benefactor or by virtue of being in the right place at the right time. This would be far from the truth, quite disingenuous, and also do the bloke a very severe misservice, to be honest. You see, following attaining his master's degree out of Oxford University in both French and history, David Frost, as he was known back then, joined the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in 87. Shortly after that, he was posted to Greece to cover Greek Cypriot politics and the Cyprus problem. Now, for many of you out there, you may not remember that, but Greece and Cyprus this wasn't always a happy place to go on holidays. In fact, it was a dangerous place to go on holidays. And Frost was in there as a senior diplomat right after, in the immediate aftermath of that, all that hostility, because Greece was a hotbed of diplomatic maneuverings. I mean, you had Henry Kissinger going there, you had all the UN ambassadors going there. As the Greeks had just recovered from the Turkish invasion of Cyprus. In, in 1974, following the, Cypri the Cypriot coup d'etat, that was ordered by the Greek military junta, who ordered that the rebellion might unite Greece and Cyprus again. The Turkish invasion basically said enough of that, and they annexed that Greek Cypriot population of somewhere around 150,000 men, women and children that were basically expelled from the territory. Inevitably, the Turkish invasion ended up in the partition of Cyprus along that UN monitored green line, which still divides Cyprus today and the formation of a de facto autonomous uh, Turkish Cypriot administration in the north. In 83, the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus declared independence. So it was going on. Of course, by the way, only Turkey recognizes that. Now, so Frost spent six years in this hotbed of diplomatic negotiations, and even in that time showed his intelligence and learned to manage to learn how to speak Greek before he was sent to Brussels as first secretary for economic and financial affairs, a very senior position. He worked on EU budgets. He also worked on the economic and financial implications of the enlargement of Central Europe, and he worked on the Euro. He worked alongside, directly alongside, John Kerr. And John Kerr at the time was the UK's number one man on the world stage within the, within the you know, international relations. And he was deputy head also of the European Union's external department, covering international trade policy issues and relations with the Balkans and Eastern Europe. Frost then held this post until, he held that post until 2001, when he moved as economic advisor to the embassy in Paris. Now, having returned to London later on to become head of the UK's internal EU department, he then became director for the European Union in the Foreign Office. He led the work on a range of economic and social issues, notably, by the way, the resistance to the initial working time directive and the negotiations, the further negotiations on the EU's multi-annual budget framework. Now, it should be remembered that it was a lot more complex than it might sound because the UK had gained presidency of the European Union in 2005, and which, by the way, I'll remind you, surprisingly for many of you, was under Tony Blair. Now, Frost's career began to go more political because from 2006, he was no longer at the forefront of those trade negotiations because he served up until October 2008 as Her Majesty's Ambassador to Denmark. He was basically now 100% diplomat or politician, call it what you will. 
From 2008 to 2010, he became Director of Strategy and Policy Planning in the Foreign Office before going into the Department of Business, Innovation and Skills, where he served three years as Director for Europe. Which, by the way, as well as being Trade and International Affairs, was at the time Her Majesty's Government's most senior trade policy official. Now, we have to remember that it was policy official. You see, Frost had gone from a deal maker to being um, a policy maker. And those positions require very different skill sets. Senior public services can, servants rather, can devise a strategy, but it's up to the negotiators at the coalface to deliver it. And the UK's guy on the ground was Sir Ivan Rogers. However, Frost in 2013, um, he joined the Scotch Whiskey Association. And in 2016, as their CEO, he authored a pre-Brexit referendum article for Portland Communications, a well-respected company in the UK, in which he supported the case for remaining in the EU. He later reneged on that and told other people that he actually didn't vote to, uh, to stay in the EU, which is not true. Because he said that leaving this, and I'm quoting here, would be fraught with economic risk. So, and this is where one must draw some conclusions. Here is a man that in 2016 said openly that Brexit was dangerous. And oh boy, how right he was. Because Brexit, that came on top of Trump, Boris Johnson's and Nigel Farage's best mates, who dumped the 25% tariff on whiskey. Then it got hit by COVID, and then to put the icing on the cake, Brexit came along. Now, Frost also knew that the smaller distillers would be hit hardest, and he was 100% correct, because many of those smaller breweries now are hanging on by their fingernails as the bureaucracy mountains climb even higher and transport costs are going right after them, and it's rapidly happening. In fact, transport costs have gone up by 38% and it's still going north. There's no sign of it going east, west or south, just north. Now, Frost was officially appointed by Boris in June, but he had been working alongside the PM as early as April. So, Frost, so for Frost to claim that there was not enough time, given that he had officially six months to fix things from the previous administration is quite frankly rubbish because Frost had been working on it before his official appointment. But even if that was not the case, Frost was the one blowing, one of them, blowing the trumpet of let's get the deal done ASAP, which is completely counter to any skilled negotiator's position. The EU had already given three extensions and were still willing to give more, though they were tiresome and weary of it. Frost knew this. He knew they would give them another extension. But Frost, as the lead negotiator, said, stuff that for a bunch of bananas. We're for the off. Now, Frost thought he was a politician again or maybe a diplomat, but he certainly wasn't thinking like a negotiator. He was out of his depth, pure and simple. The main man at the centre of the UK's trade, the main man at the centre of the EU's trade negotiations was Ivan Rogers. And he had enough of the crap that he saw coming down the road. And he resigned in 2017. And he was never replaced with anybody of similar experience, stature, respect. He knew, and he said it, um, Rogers knew and said it openly, that the UK's policy, which they were pursuing, of trying to deal with governments on an individual basis, was one, never going to work, and two, it was going to piss off the guys in Europe. He was right on both counts. Frost, he also knew this, and only had to make one decision, to take the pressure off the negotiating table. He had to pull back on Article 50. He had to do it. As well as this, Frost had spent two months waffling on for the last two months of the negotiations, waffling on about fish. But he was trying to score political brownie points. He was trying to score 
a, a nice image on front of the very, very pro-Brexit people who are still voting in the UK. He was thinking like a politician. He was not thinking as a negotiator. No negotiator would do that. A negotiator will try and get the best deal that they can get. And what they will certainly not do is tie their hands behind their back and they... And to, Nobody in the right mind will let the opposing party on the other side of the table let them know that their hands are tied behind their back. So the upshot of all of this was now Frost is on a media circus. He's on a tour. He's like one of those pop stars delivering a message that, well, it wasn't me. It was them. It was them. In other words, he's admitting that the deal was bad. That's all. That's the only reason he'd say that. But it was the best that we could do because given the circumstances of what we were handed, rubbish. The problem was that the circumstances driving negotiations were political, diplomatic, but they weren't about trade. They weren't about the well-being of the British economy. They left the British people on the shore. They don't care and now we're seeing the results. The concerns of keeping in office were head and shoulders above those of trade. And that was Frost's fault. In short, it was great for a political gain, but it was an absolute disaster for those on the UK side of the negotiating table. The solution, well, there is only one solution. The UK has to go back to the EU. It has to say, look, we screwed up. Okay, now can we turn the clock back for two years? Maybe we can get through this. Maybe we can get some other solution here because it's not working for the EU. They're spending too much time on it and it's not working for us because we're spending too much time on it. Meanwhile, trade is, excuse me, dropping off. So can we suspend everything? Now, in order to stop the crap, the borders at the borders, the EU may even agree. Now, not saying they will agree, they may agree. If Frost can get the EU to agree to that, he can go back to the British people and say, look, it's okay, we're going to just go back to the way things are for two years and we're going to find a solution. Okay, they'll, they'll do something like that. If they can do something like that, it will help. Okay, now even if the EU did agree to that, I'm not saying it's likely, it would be difficult, but if there's will, it can be done. Because of the way Johnson and Frost and Liz Truss have acted. It would mean that the deals they did with Japan and Australia, they would have to renege on. And that is the, the garbage can that is now British trade policy. And the fault of the disastrous way in which they have handcuffed negotiators is lays directly at the feet, directly at the altar of Boris Johnson and his cohorts Gove, Jacob Rees-Moggs and Frost. And under no circumstances can the British people be blamed for this. This is the problem of politicians and their stupid supporters in the media that are following another agenda. Thanks for watching and thanks for listening and the bell and the subscribe would very much appreciate it. Thank you.